I am the managing partner and founder of Tiva Capital. I'm also the executive director for Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program here in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, prior to this, I spent uh, about 10 years in Africa, most of the time in Equatorial Guinea, working directly in the telecom space and um, was one of the first companies to to use the fiber optic line that uh, that provides the the core backbone of connectivity in the in, in Equatorial Guinea. So it's great to, to be here and to, and to see you all again. Okay, perfect. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, myself, I'm Charles Colo, leading uh, sales and marketing for uh, Ghanaian FinTech. And uh, so in order to, to start, uh, I would like to, uh, to jump right in the, the different questions. And I would like to start with the, his ex excellency. So from your perspective, what are the main challenges that uh, Africa will have to face in the, five ye in the next five years, please? Uh, thank you very much, Paul. I, I think um, uh, this uh, tech campus was uh, conceived uh, before COVID-19. So of course, we still uh, have in our mind this, uh, this, this set, but things have changed. So. As uh, Minister of Finance, Economy and Planning, the challenge we see today in order to sustain growth in the next five years is to cope with COVID-19. How are we going to navigate uh, this? I think most of the African countries, I'm in touch with, my, with other finance ministers. Our priority now is to make sure that we can uh, survive COVID-19. We can mitigate the, the, the negative impact COVID-19. So, as you might be aware, most of the African countries, including Equatorial Guinea, we were pursuing the, sustain uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Africa Agenda 2063. And with COVID-19, we might be going back because uh, we have to rethink uh, where we are and the, the, the baseline we have to do. So, our priority now is to deal with this COVID-19. What I can say uh, as a finance minister, that uh, we have defined priorities. The first, the first priority is to maintain the, the stability of the macroeconomy, fiscal stability. That's a priority. Second priority is to channel resources to strengthen the health sector because we are dealing with a health crisis. And we know, all of us, we know very well that our health sector in Africa was not the best. So now we have to invest significant resources to really put our health sector in good shape. That's the second priority. The third priority is to mitigate the impact on the most vulnerable people, most vulnerable people, because uh, COVID-19 has uh, created an unprecedented crisis, and this crisis does not affect everyone at the same way. So the, the, the poorest one, the most vulnerable one, are deeply affected. So we are putting in place social protection system to protect those that are in a very vulnerable situation. These small and medium enterprises might not collapse. If they collapse, they will be firing a lot of people, a lot of families will lose the, the income. So we don't want that. So basically what we're doing now in Africa and in Ecuador Union is to find the most reasonable way to cope with this COVID-19. Assuming that we have uh, we don't have too much resources, mm. so first we keep the macro fiscal stability. We try to keep it. Uh, second, we rethink the way we allocate resources, giving priority to health and social sector. Third, we put in place robust protection social protection system in order to protect the vulnerable one. And fourth, we create a package of a stimulus to boost SMEs. In Equatorial Guinea, we have passed a law, a decree, a decree 43, and in that decree you have all these lists that we are putting in place. And the good thing is that when when in this panel, when talking about the impact uh, of technology on economic growth, in this package of stimulus, we have created a, a set of incentives for the SMEs. And among these incentives, you have the how to reduce the act, how to reduce the cost of internet and other means 
for the small and medium enterprise. So this conversation we're having today, it's very important for, for, for Equatorial Guinea and for Africa. And we think, all of us, we think the priority today is to stop with this COVID-19. After the COVID-19, after we navigate this moment, the priority is still the same. We have to boost inclusive growth. We have to boost sustainable growth. So this is what we are looking for. And this is, I believe, uh, all the African countries are looking for. We are fully committed to, to, to achieve the sustainable development goals. We are fully committed to see the Africa Agenda 63 succeeding. But for now, we have to survive the COVID-19. It's mm. good to see that all the African countries are doing, let's say, very well. Uh, people are suffering. Uh, people are losing families. But uh, so today, uh, the situation is much more better than, people, than what people thought a couple of months ago. So which means Africa has been able, after all this suffering, after all this problem, Africa has been able to build some resilience. That proved to be more resilient than, than uh, what people thought. So the, 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 the key point for us is to navigate this COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, to, 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 build, to be able to, to be more resilient. And after that, we keep pursuing the SDGs in the Africa Agenda 2063. This is what I think, we're, this is what we're doing in the of Guinea. And I can, set, I can say that all my colleagues, the African finance minister, are in the same mood. So thank you very much for this what I can for the moment. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point of view because, um, so the question that, uh, that we can, that I would like to ask Paul is um, based on uh, what uh, his Excellency mentioned, what are the main obstacles to, uh, to the development of technology in Africa? So we've heard about COVID-19, but what is your perspective and do you feel like COVID-19 is also one main obstacle, please? Yeah, thank you, Charles, for that. Uh, I would like to first uh, piggyback on a few points that His Excellency made. Um, when we look at the effects that COVID-19 had and how it's changed the way the economy is operating, I think the first step is to look at there were many discrepancies between different economic groups within the societies. Uh, here in the U.S., for example, uh, many of the vulnerable were hit, but then you look at why were they vulnerable in the first place. Uh, I look at this, this is a very terrible uh, pandemic, of course, is happening, and I feel very, my heart goes out to every life that's been lost. But I also see, you know, I guess the entrepreneur side of me sees the, the opportunity to take a close look at what we need to change to make to put ourselves on a better footing in the, in the future. Here in Detroit, the, which was hit really hard by the COVID-19, uh, probably the third uh, at a point we were third to only New York and, and Chicago, uh, it, it brought a lot of resources together and it also brought focus on the importance that health, the health sector has, uh, because if one person's sick, you can't sort of close your door and say that's their problem. It, it comes on your doorstep as well. It also sheds light on the importance of the SME market. So a lot of funding came through to the small businesses and medium-sized businesses. And it became clear that without that element of the society, without that support, then your, you know, your economy collapses. Over 98% of businesses in the U.S. 98% are have less than 20 employees, you know, but people don't think about that. But now all of these things come to light. So what I'm seeing, though, in addition to the economic stimulus is having the technical um, the technical assistance for the small businesses. I, I say having capital is important, but without the proper technical assistance, then you don't have productive usage of capital. You're throwing money at something that for businesses that were already in many cases vulnerable because they didn't have a good economic structure and program in place. But directly speaking to your, your question, though, uh, in terms of Africa, uh, obviously in the, in the very immediate future dealing with the COVID-19, but I think the long-term uh, success of Africa is going to hinge on a couple of things. One, having the infrastructure and connectivity. And this has been a major point for the last 15, 20 years. And I really applaud what Equatorial Guinea has done, uh, what Hithe has done in terms of ensuring that 
the connectivity is made available for all segments of the population because that's that's going to help the whole tide rise. I, I think that one missed opportunity is the housing of data. So right now, much of the data that you that you're using and receiving comes from Europe, from the U.S. And then, by the way, that expense that's a very expensive transit point and and very vulnerable transit point. So uh, I think more data centers need to be developed, and and, um, and there's infrastructural requirements around that, right? So with the right data uh, data centers in place, you can host. And this terrible, uh, tragic situation that people are, are, ex are experiencing. How how do you think that we can lead and champion technology in Africa? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like a small message to uh, our audience in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, so a small message in Spanish. Agradezco a Equatorial Guinea para invitarme aquí. Le felicito para sus ambiciones. No tengan miedo de sus ambiciones, porque pueden alcanzar mucho más que pueden imaginar. Así que no hay que tener miedo de ser ambiciosos. So, um, really, I've got a few points that I wanted to, um, to make uh, concerning the previous comments. First of all, people are looking at Africa and they're saying, okay, yes, they've handled this pandemic pretty well in terms of deaths and in terms of uh, controlling the pandemics. I'd like to go a step further, actually. I'd like to say two comments, and I don't want to talk too much politics. But first of all, I'd like to also say that the ministries of finance, the central banks, the regulators, and the banks, for that matter, have also acted pretty decisively to support industry, to support small businesses, and uh, to make sure that the system does not collapse. So, A, you had the health system collapsing, but you also actually had the whole macroeconomic system. And I think that the reaction there showed that we were professional, we were quick, we were responsive, and, uh, and that's, uh, those are great attributes to have. It shows that we've got the competences and, uh, and the understanding to support, uh, to support the econ economies, to support our businesses and to support our financial system. That was very important. On the political side, there's two points that I wanted to make. One of them is we're still seeing that actually the rest of the world is treating Africa differently than others. So I'm talking about the ratings agencies. I'm even talking about uh, institutions. I don't want to say the World Bank, the IMF, but some, some of the shareholders at the World Bank and IMF are still treating Africa differently, which puts us in a slightly more difficult position. So the IMF called for exceptional circumstances or exceptional measures for exceptional circumstances. But when it comes to Africa, it's, ah, no, we don't trust you. And no, you can't have access to this, you can't have access to that, or you need to, you need to meet these requirements. So which, which basically means that we also need to do politics a lot smarter and we're going to have to depend on ourselves. So that's point number one. We know now that we need to depend on ourselves to make things happen. In terms of leveraging technology, there's a few things, and again, I want to go back to government. This pandemic has shown that we can do things that we did not think were possible or that have taken us a long time to decide on. So even in terms of governments, in terms of making payments, uh, so, uh, social, uh, social welfare payments, digital social welfare payments like we saw in Togo, I've seen the government of Tunisia now have, we can, you can do things online that you couldn't do for the past five or seven years. We've been calling to do some administrative papers online now you can do them uh, you can do them online. So the digita digitization of government is going to make life easier for businesses. And I think that's very important. So digitization is not just about the private sector, it's about also the government and government reforms and government digitizing itself. So I think we'll see that actually in terms of, uh, in terms of some of the reforms, and that will accelerate digitization within the, the real economy as well. So as governments digitize, that will simplify matters for, for businesses, and that will lead to greater entrepreneurship, less barriers, less constraints, and, uh, and a level playing field. The other thing that we've seen, for example, during this past, uh, this past three months, is we've seen 3,000 3, jobs created in Cape Town by Amazon. So those jobs were created not necessarily just in terms of developers, but they were creating for their, um, for their customer service, uh, customer service uh, division, and, uh, and support divisions. But those jobs depend on a number of things. They depend on good access to, uh, good access to, uh, to internet, because a lot of these jobs are actually remote jobs. So in terms of these 3,000 jobs, people will be working from home, supporting Amazon globally, and working with Amazon globally. And that actually means that today, and I was talking to some HR managers, and that today, really, a global company such as Amazon, or a global company such as Microsoft, 
or a global company like Facebook, they don't, it doesn't matter where you're based, yeah, as long as you can support that particular institution. They've managed to show that you can remote work and you can be based wherever you want and still service a company. So that's a massive opportunity for Africa. So all of a sudden, we, Africa is part of the global economy or global, at least part of the global digital economy. Saying that, there's still structural problems that we need to solve. 94% of our pharmaceutical products are imported. Yeah, it's, digitization is not going to solve that. Yeah, so what's going to solve that is energy, it's local uh, uh, value chain, local supply chain, etc. But I feel that Africa is in a great position in any case. Both politically, we're, uh, we're relatively neutral, should we say, when it comes to China and the USA, Europe and, uh, Europe and China. So everyone wants to near shore. So Africa is perfectly located for, uh, for the near shoring in terms of Europe. In terms of servicing, even in terms of servicing the USA and servicing Latin America, both from a language perspective and also from a logistical perspective. So I think we're uniquely positioned, and in terms of digitization, that will only help. But ultimately, as Amazon have shown, you need to make sure that internet is accessible and affordable and that uh, and universal. And I think that when I was in Equatorial Guinea last year, they were cognizant of the fact that the price of the internet needs to come down. So, uh, and I think that uh, we're working on that and also the, uh, the, uh, the mobile phone companies. So both the regulator and the mobile phone companies and the uh, service providers. But unless you have affordable and accessible, you won't be able to empower, uh, empower others. So my only concern, my only, so super positive in terms of what we can do and how we can leverage this. And we're already leveraging it. But so the only concern is, the, my only fear is, is that engineers, so when I look at Tunisia, when I look at Morocco, and I'm sure it's the same in terms of Equatorial Guinea in terms of, uh, in terms of, some, of their, uh, some of their best brains are still having to work abroad or being poached from, uh, from Europe, from, uh, from the USA and others. So we're losing some of our best engineers for, to, uh, to other countries. So how do we make sure that we keep our best brains in the country? In, uh, in country? Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a very good uh, that's a very good question, um, and I, I would love to hear some feedback from uh, from the audience if they can uh, add uh, more elements to this question. Uh, so, um, based on everything that you said, Omar, uh, I wanted to say that I really commend uh, His Excellency for bringing the the price of data down in uh, uh, for in uh, Equatorial Guinea because it's a, it's a big deal, especially in Africa, for people to be able to access these um, data access uh, web websites being able to learn on youtube these type of things and uh, that takes you in, in uh, that takes us in uh, in another uh, direction when it comes to fintech what how fintech is relevant as part of the uh, the digitization of uh, of uh, the government that has been mentioned uh, before so um, yes yeah, so what is the place of fintech in equatorial guinea and also in uh, Africa. Uh, okay, that's a very interesting question. I'm gonna be. I will be honest. Uh, the the ecosystem of fintech is. Uh, I mean, uh, barely exists in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, we, we we are we are studying, but uh, over the last few months, we've done a couple of things to make sure that we can boost the eco the ecosystem of fintech in Equatorial Guinea. We believe we have to do that because uh, we are dealing with the issue of how to get a uh, lot of people into the banking system. In the traditional banking system, it's not going to work. It's impossible. It's obsolete. I think Paul said that before, and, and Omar was also making comment on this regard. So with the fintech, we have a massive opportunity to, to leapfrog. And because in the government of Equatorial Guinea, we believe today that uh, uh, the technological, the exclusion of the people in the technology, what does at the end is it perpetuates poverty. So we have to mm. make sure that we can bring everyone on board. And through the fintech, there is a possibility to take the financial services, all these services to the people that are very very far from the from the center the the the, the, the center of uh, of of the cities of the where decisions are being taken because what we are trying to do is that everyone in equatorial can access financial services 
We have in Equatorial, in Equatorial Guinea today, we have five uh, commercial banks. We have uh, the Societe General, we have BGFI, we have uh, CSE Bank, we have Bank, we have Ecobank. And these banks are doing very well. I push them very hard, but they cannot uh, get everyone on board. So we need the fintech to take care of that. In Equatorial Guinea, what we are doing today is to try to create an enabling environment so these kind of companies can really, really grow and thrive. And one of the things we've, we've done in the last few months is to support the creation of the first microfinancial institution of Equatorial, microfinancial, the association of the microfinancial institution of Equatorial Guinea. We, had like, we have like three, financial, uh, three microfinancial institutions and they were working separately. They were not uh, talking to each other. They, they, mm. All of them, they were doing things like, okay, we are on our own game, but we think that we have to bring all of them together. We have to find a way that they can align their objective because at the end of the day, they will serve better the needs of the people. So we are doing that. Um, we have support the creation of this institution. And it's very sad that uh, Dr. Sidi, and I think he's having problems to join us because one mm. of the projects we have with Badea is to create, uh, is, to, is to support financially and technically the micro, small, a medium enterprise in Equatorial Guinea. I think uh, Paul and, and Omar have also mentioned that the, the, the small and medium enterprise, they need capital, they need money, but they need technical assistance and they need some guarantees that they will have easy access or cheap access to internet, to electricity, to water and all that. So we are doing this amazing project with uh, Dr. Sidi, with Badea, uh, and unfortunately he's not here. So we are doing, we are fully committed to, to create an enabling environment for the fintech in Equatorial Guinea. Today, it barely exists, to be honest. But we think in the next few months, uh, we, will, we, will, we will show some surprise. The good thing, as I said before, is that we have uh, uh, been able to bring all these small companies together, to work together, and, and, and talk to each other, and, and align the incentive. So uh, with, by bringing down the, the, the cost of internet, the cost of the data, by bringing down the, the the price of most of the inputs the small the micro small and medium enterprise they need to do the business what we're doing is to make sure that uh they can try we have like an issue an issue to deal with because we are part of the cmac which is basically six countries equatorial guinea gabon uh, congo brazzaville uh, chad central africa and cameroon and there is a legal framework and we are trying to change this legal framework so it can allow the fintech to really, really thrive. In the legal framework we have today, I'm not going to say it's obsolete, but uh, the central bank is working very hard to update it. So these are the mm -hmm. kind of things we're doing in, in, in Central Africa, in CEMAC, in Equatorial Guinea, to boost fintech. We, because we believe uh, financial exclusion at the end perpetuates poverty. And with uh, technology, with, with data, we have the possibility to get a lot of people on board not and not replicating not using traditional means because it would be very cost for us it would it, it would be we cannot we cannot afford that you if we want to get everyone on board we want to bank everyone using the the traditional banking is not going to be possible we don't have that means we don't have uh, that resources so through fintech we can achieve that goal so that's why in Equatorial Guinea, in the Ministry of Finance, Economy and Planning, we are pushing very hard. For instance, one of the things we're doing, uh, we have joined the Better Than Cash Alliance. Okay. It's an alliance by Visa, Visa Mastercard, uh, Villa Melinda Gates Foundation, and so on, in order to make sure that we can introduce in innovative ways to do transaction, business to business, uh, business to government. So we are doing these uh, sort of things to make sure that the fintech can have a feel, can have a role to play. And we believe we are in the in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, thank you very much for for that. And uh, I will make sure that I will connect with you to present you what we do here in Ghana. Um, so uh, I don't want to take too much time um, so that we can hear uh, other people as well, but I would like to finish with a question to, to, the, to the group here. Um, about the KPIs. So I would like to know what KPI does Africa need to track in order to attain, to, uh, in order to attain sustainable growth and development. We talked about COVID-19, we talked about uh, fintech, we talked about banking, um, 
but I would like to know, okay, so what, the, what are the, the, the two or three KPIs that we need to track, please? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, and the way I was explaining the concept of KPI, which stands for Key Performance Indicators, is if you were sitting uh, somewhere remote and you did not have access to any forms of communication, but you could look on one piece of paper and look at a few things and know how your company, your organization, your country is doing, what would those things be? And I think if you think about it in that perspective, it you know, it lends itself to a couple of different answers. I think that there's three different, there's a three-prong approach. One would be the general connectivity. So how much data is being pushed, how, what percentage of the population has connectivity, and at what speed and what price point. And that's, I said more than three already, but I got a couple more prongs to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but that, that, that's the basic, right? And that's more of an infrastructural thing. And, uh, and I know that's in development across Africa, still some work to do, but that's, there's a lot of movement in that space. I, I think the next one is, is uh, just as important, but it's not measured to my knowledge as much as it should be. And that's the economic side of it. How many startup companies in tech do you have? how much capital is, is being invested, uh, third party or direct investment in technical, and how many patents you have. And then I would say there's a, the third prong is the educational and societal effect. And to me, you know, the longevity of this is how, how much you have the youth engaged in technology, in coding. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Omar, what about you? Do you? Would you like to add something else? Yeah, I think uh, I think Paul's given us an, a, an excellent summary. So what we've seen in terms of this uh, this uh, this pandemic is health is uh, health is number one. You can't do it unless you've got a healthy society and you've got health under control. Saying that on the tech side, it's also shown the uh, the, the, the the power of tech and uh, and also highlighted where uh, where we're slightly deficient. I mean, I'm going to come back again to uh, to the role of government. We've got the the minister here. I know the, the minister is very reform minded. But it shows you what this what this pandemic has shown has actually shown that government has got a role to play in uh, in keeping and sustaining economies. And here, this has been a bit of a World Cup in terms of uh, governments. We've seen we've really seen some people shine. We've seen some uh, some uh, some guys. Uh, the, the big players and the people who have, uh, who have been reactive have managed to shine and show how important government is and what they can do to assist economies. So I really would like to see the digitization of government, and that could be a new index. I mean, we've had the the, the, uh, the ease of doing business, and uh, I don't know how much tech and or digitization and the ease uh, is is measured there, but that could be a potential KPI in terms of in terms of government. I mean, to come back to uh, to His Excellency, and yes, in terms of Africa, I travel. I've been to about forty countries on the continent, and I see a country like Algeria, which is obviously very petro rich. And I don't know why, but the banking system is very antiquated. So everything is still done, I, mean, I don't know if it's the French system or not, but still done over the counter. People are going in with big bags of money. So nothing is digitized in terms of banking. But then you go to, uh, to other countries, such as, uh, such as Kenya, to some extent Nigeria, and things are digitized. And fintech, as you know, is, pos is possibly the sector that attracts the most VC. So there is money there. I was also at a, on a webinar yesterday, and uh, the lady from, uh, from Finland, who held, who uh, who, um, who who heads FinFund? She says that money is not an issue for energy. The issue is bankable projects, and I think that VCs have got money, and they've got money to put in different projects and in entrepreneurs. And fintech has attracted a lot of money because there is something to be done there. And as the minister said, yes, in terms of SEMAC, so these these uh, SEMAC obviously there's a great opportunity in terms of uh, in terms of the region because you've got macroeconomic stability, you've got currency stability, so that's great for investors. But in terms of the regulatory environment, these guys need to get together to make sure that it's easy for, A, for the entrepreneurs to, uh, to create business, well, not to create businesses, but to manage the regulatory environment and to manage digital payments, cross-border digital payments, etc. And then that will make it a fantastic opportunity for the VC funds and investors to come in. But in terms of uh, my KPI, it's really uh, digitization of government. And uh, and ultimately, that regulatory environment for uh, to to enable uh, to, to to enable entrepreneurs and therefore investment into uh, into different sectors. Okay, thank you very much, Omar. And uh, I like your 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 
the idea of a World Cup of Government. I will use that uh, in the future. <laughs> and uh, His Excellency, if you wanted to uh, identify uh, major KPIs for um, for the growth and the development of uh, of your country in Africa, what would that be? Wow, that's a, that's a very tough question because it's very difficult. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a minister of planning, so we I think in terms of planning, I think uh, Paul and Omar have said it all. But I, I I would like to add something. When we talk about the objective we are trying to achieve in the few next five years or decade, from the perspective of finance minister, planning minister, we uh, keep in mind that. Uh, whatever we are doing, we have to make sure that we cope very well with the mega trends that uh, we are dealing with today. I mean, uh, the demographic, uh, the shift in power. I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the power, but there is a shift in power going on. Uh, the rural urbanization, people are coming from rural areas, moving to, to cities. Uh, the climate change and the scarcity of resources. And then the technology. So whatever we do whatever we we implement we have to we have to see the way we are going to deal with these uh, big mega trends now for me uh, a very easy way to put things is okay we have the the 17 uh, sustainable development goal we have this agenda 2063 africa but i would say just uh, in order to, to make sure that we are moving toward the right direction we have to see the the, the role that the youth is playing in the society First. Mm. Second, the role that the women are playing in the society. Third, how widespread is the technology? So I will just summarize these three. Youth, women, and technology. And with that, we have an inclusive society. If the youth are on board, if the women are on board, if we use technology in a very uh, efficient way, in a very inclusive way, then society will be going very well. So youth, women, and technology. That's I hope a, in, in five years, uh, I will be able to tell you now we have more youth in leading business, uh, working in the government. We have more women leading business, working in government. And my very good friend, Omar, I hope in one year I will say we have digitized the fiscal administration of Equatorial Guinea. That's all I can say. In one year, yeah, Omar, we'll talk about that. <laughs> I think that we can work on that. <laughs> but uh, that's that's a ve th those were very good submissions, and I think as for the students that are listening to to us right now, uh, I'm sure that they learned a lot, uh, especially with this last one about the KPIs. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you for this in insightful contribution. And I would like to encourage uh, the tag audience to to uh, to contribute, and maybe if. Uh, we have questions for, for the audience, for the, for the tech team. Okay. Yes, and uh, if... Uh, uh, do you hear me? I don't hear anything from do Tay. Do you hear me? So, uh, what I would like... Um, um, so, yeah. Do you hear me? So, in, in, as far as cross-border payments is concerned, uh, is there a, uh, so, a plan to improve uh, so first, uh, cross first of all, allow me to thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, to give you a few words about uh, uh, Badea, the Arab Bank for Economic yes. Development in Africa, so, and also about the uh, Development Bank. How we can contribute creating that exact platform? I think they're trialing it in West Africa first before uh, before extending it to the rest of the continent. But really, what they're going to do is they're being, they're going to create a clearing platform. To uh, to enable local currency payments for uh, for, the, for for a buyer from let's say Egypt purchasing something from uh, from a seller in Ghana, so uh, and they will look at all these different uh, transactions and then whatever balance there is they'll clear it with the central bank at the end of the day the same day payment so that people don't have to go through a dollar or euro to be able to buy something cross border. I mean, the Semak, uh, the, the Semak region, obviously, there's uh, the CFA. You've got in West Africa, you've got a number of countries using, uh, using the CFA as well. So that already facilitates uh, cross-border payments. But, uh, but I think we are seeing quite a lot of progress on that front, and that will be on a continental-wide basis, once also the central banks and the regulatory uh, challenges have been overcome. But it is taking place. It's something that, uh, 
the regulators are cognizant of. And if we want to increase trade, we'll have to be able to pay in local currency in country and then clear at the end of the day within uh, within one one settlement system. So I think it's taking place, uh, absolutely, and it will only accelerate. Mm. Without having okay. to go and using the dollar or the euro or the RMB or whatever it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, for that. And um, when it comes to... Um, so there's another question here concerning... Um, the, the banks. So we've heard that the banks are obsolete. Um, but how do you access credit without banks? How do you act, how do you have a credit score? How do you uh, get a loan to grow your business, to buy your house, to increase consumption? How how do you do that without a bank? Okay, uh, okay, Paul. Paul, are you on the join in? I thought that you were. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm here with you, sir. Uh, Sulago um, first, or no? Please, you go first. I'll be happy to jump in. Okay. Up, oh, you muted yourself again. Yes, we don't uh, hear you. Charles, just one, just one clarification. The banks are not obsolete. <laughs> obsolete. The way they've been doing things, it is obsolete. So they have okay. to update. They have to upgrade. They have to uh, be able to cope with the moment. So. I will, as a finance minister, I will never say the banks are obsolete, but the way they've been doing things, that is obsolete. So they have to change. And you can see in, in many places that the, the big banks are buying fintechs because they know that uh, that's the way to go. So they are not obsolete. They just have to update themselves a little bit. In Equatorial Guinea, in, in, in Africa, that is something uh, that we are proud of because not in Equatorial, in Africa, you, you can see that in many places in Africa, we have uh, taken the lead. We've we've gone pretty before. The pretty, we, we are pretty advanced. Mpesa mm. and, and, and and in other Kenya and many places, Africa uh, took the lead in that because the need was there. So the banks are not obsolete. The way they've been doing things, it's obsolete, and they are changing. So I'm gonna hand over to you, Paul. Yeah. So. I, I think, as uh, as Excellency said, there's a a, a time and space for for uh, all participants. But going back to uh, a term that you use, Charles, it's, it's about the KPI, and you think about what is the KPI for banks. And it's not necessarily, you know, at least in the short term, or quarter by quarter performance, uh, how, mu how much uh, the, the business society grows. I mean, they make money off service fees. They make money off of, of, uh, of loans. And that's what drives them. And because of that, there's more fees and and and, uh, and more money to to derive from servicing larger enterprises. And because of that, then the smaller, riskier ventures tend to get underfunded. And that's just a systematic. So in the in the U.S. and I, I don't know if it's um, a global uh, component as well, Omar or His Excellency, if you if you know, you can tell me. If there's this. These entities called uh, CDFIs, so it's Community Development Financial Institutions funds, and they play a big component in providing capital to startups. Uh, they provide a lot of capital to companies or who are typically not fundable, and their KPI is based off how much the community develops, and they do a good job at because that's what they get measured on. Banks don't get measured on how much the community develops. That's a, a long-term uh, success factor, but that's not what the shareholder, that's what's not going to make their stock price go up, right? And that's not what's going to drive success. So I think on one side that you have to, there, there's a, a, a point where institutions have to step in and provide that extra uh, liquidity, Because liquidity and cash flow is a lifeblood of, of all businesses, but especially small businesses. Another statistic is that 82% of, of small businesses fail because of lack of access to, to funding. And, um, and, and that's where if you really want to uh, transition your economy, providing the lifeblood of your highest growth sector, which is the small businesses, is going to have a direct direct effect and direct uh, component. So aligning the interest with the capital providers with a, with the community, I think, is a is a huge component. And and as such, the CDFIs are in a much better uh, 
uh, space to provide that technical assistance. So as I said before, it's a simple equation. There's capital is one component, plus technical assistance ends up as productive usage of capital and economic sustainability and growth. Without that, if you're providing one without the other, then you know, you're going to have a lot of frustrated parties on one side of the seesaw. Okay. And um, so, um, so when it comes to, uh, to the big investment from a VC into African fintechs, African uh, companies, we've seen a very strong trend uh, coming from the U.S. where African companies will go into San Francisco or Detroit or New York or Atlanta or this type of big uh, hub of uh, technology in order to raise money to then go back to Africa. Is it, something, is it a trend that you see as well? Or is it something that, um, or is it possible for African companies to raise money directly from uh, these big VCs? I, I think it's possible, and I, I see certain uh, private equity and VC markets starting to develop. Um, one, uh, the cost of capital, we, we talk about the cost of internet and the cost of utility, but the cost of capital in many countries in Africa is prohibitively more expensive than that of the U.S. and Europe. So from a, a, a pure arbitrage experience, I could, I could borrow money at 3% or 4% here and and do some factoring or funding for businesses in, in Africa who are, you know, where 10, 15% is not outside of the norm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there is there is a, a very big gap in the cost of capital uh, between some of the more um, traditionally established markets with with the institutions behind them versus some of the more developing uh, markets. And that's where I think the, the government uh, has to step in and provide some incentives. And, and as, uh, as uh, Mr. Omar mentioned, also the legal and technical framework for it to happen because it, you know, in, in, in many countries, you look at the risk of the business, but you also look at the the, the legal and technical risk. So, uh, as the markets grow, they have to sort of step a little bit ahead and show that they're very investor friendly. And the least, you know, one of the examples I give is that the U.S. is considered to be uh, one of the safest, if not the safest, uh, markets and they have one of the lowest cost of capital in, in the world. And it's not because, I mean, we've had, you know, uh, a lot of turbulence. We've had um, uh, probably more presidents get, you know, um, harmed in the course of doing their job than most countries in the world. But it's because the framework here supports investment and supports the capitalistic market. Uh, it also supports companies that, uh, that fail, the bankruptcy laws and everything like that is in place. So that's why uh, this this environment is very conducive to outside capital. So I think the talent is there. I think the drive and the motivation is there, certainly the resources, but we have to create and foster a very healthy environment from the capital market standpoint. Okay. Thank you for this uh, very interesting, very good uh, answer. And, uh, and I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sidi, uh, CEO of um, uh, BDA. BDA. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Sidi, you, you hear me right now? Yeah, no, I hear you very clearly. Okay. So, you hear me? Uh, yes, we hear you very well. I would love to, uh, to hear Thanks. from you. Uh, uh, to, to first, if you can introduce yourself for the people that don't know you here. And, uh, and second, if you can um, chime in in the discussion that we are having and maybe bring your opinion of, on some of the elements, that are, on some of the things that have been discussed here. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, allow me to thank you, uh, to, to thank uh, the His Excellency Minister of Finance for giving me this opportunity. And uh, really, uh, we are glad that the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, Badea, uh, to be part uh, of this conversation. Uh, as you may know, uh, uh, the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa is a multilateral development financial institution, uh, which is uh, the to uh, totally dedicated to Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's owned by 18 Arab countries, but uh, its operations are exclusively uh, for uh, Sub-Saharan African countries. 
uh, we are very much interested in, in, in this conversation because we have just started the implementation of our uh, 2030 strategy, which is a 10 year strategy, uh, uh, very much aligned with uh, uh, the SDGs, but also aligned with uh, the Agenda 2063 of the African Union. Uh, and uh, we are glad to have the Excellency Minister of Finance as part of the process of uh, uh, preparing this, uh, this strategy, and he was one of the uh, key persons who contributed uh, immensely to, to the preparation of this strategy, and this is the occasion to thank him for, for his vision and for his support to, to Badia. So, one of the main pillars of the new strategy, Badia 2030, is uh, s uh, small and medium enterprises and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, to support youth and women in Africa. So, uh, uh, the small and medium enterprises for us uh, are really the most important part of the economic tissue in Africa. As you know, uh, they, are, uh, they constitute around 80% or more uh, of the economic tissue, but only 20% have access to, 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 to finance. Mm. And uh, uh, most uh, of the debate about SMEs uh, is sometimes concentrated on the issue of, uh, of, of financing, but we do believe that uh, we need a more holistic approach to SMEs. And uh, this uh, question has been debated uh, in length, at length during the preparation of our strategy. And uh, recently uh, in Joburg, in, uh, in fact, it's a few months uh, back, in Joburg, uh, in the margin of the Africa Investment Forum, uh, Badea uh, sponsored the SMEs Champion uh, Forum, and uh, we went up, we went from that that uh, uh, forum with the idea of launching uh, an, an, a regional or international coalition to support SMEs in in Sub-Saharan Africa, because mm. we we felt that. The issue is not only uh, uh, providing finance. Of course, uh, most SMEs are complaining from not getting finance from a commercial bank, but also commercial bank, they have also their uh, risk management framework and uh, their rules. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sidi. And um, so I have a, a question from the audience right now. Um, and the question is, since technology is not cheap, how can countries and other cities in Africa uh, benefit uh, when they don't have uh, the money to get uh, this technology? And that's a uh, that's an open question for for the group. Whoever um, uh, would like to answer, feel free. So I repeat: since since technology is not cheap, how can countries and other cities in Africa? benefit when they don't have the money to get uh, this technology? Um, I, I'll jump in with that one. Technology isn't really cheap anywhere, uh, but I think that one of the, and there are some reasons not to minimi minimize the question because it's certain that there's certain, uh, certain components of technology are more expensive in certain African countries than, than in the U.S. Many people come to U.S. and buy different things because it's, or, or Dubai or China. DG or is currently unavailable. Uh, but I... Please leave a message after the tone. Uh oh When you have finished, please hang up or press the... <laughs> is that Alexa? <laughs> <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> uh, That's the use but, of technology. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It is listening to us. Uh, but I, I think that uh, some of the, it's a holistic approach. Uh, being able to finance the technology is, is, a, is a key component of it. Uh, so having the capital markets in place where, where consumers, of finance, uh, consumers of technology don't have to make a lump sum payment out of their pocket, They're, they can finance it over time. Many people in the U.S., when they go buy a new iPhone, they don't throw a thousand dollars on the counter. They pay it. They pay for it over over time. Alarm systems and, and other things. So uh, that's what's going to really facilitate more consumer um, acceptance of technology and a bit, uh, ability to use it is by making sure that some of the providers have access to, to financing so they can provide terms and payment plans to some of the users and consumers of technology and the consumers can pay for it over a period of time as opposed to having to pay for all of one, uh, one, one big payment. 
Okay. And I'm hoping that uh, with the development of uh, the the, finan the new financial um, uh, ecosystem in Africa, that would give the opportunity for people to actually pay for these um, for these uh, things over time, as you mentioned. And um, yeah, thank you for for, for your answer. And uh, would you, the rest of the guests, would you like to add something to to Paul? Uh, just one, one few thing, one, one thing. Okay, I fully agree with everything uh, Paul has said. Uh, it's not, it's not cheap. It's expensive. But he was talking about iPhone, so mm -hmm. iPhone <laughs> might be very expensive. Uh, but there's uh, other ways to to get the same uh, tool, which will do the same thing. So I think uh, this uh, brings to my mind the debate on manufacturing in Africa. As you might be aware, I think uh, Mara Group uh, is doing like has something in they have something in in Rwanda. They are manufacturing uh, phones, and we, we have to we have to think about that. And 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 that's why the the, the question Omar was asking uh, was uh, uh, the answer was that Omar was giving before regarding the the, the trans border the cross border payment. It is very important. Because mm. uh, if we are able from Equatorial Guinea to transact easily with Rwanda, easily with uh, Zambia, easily with uh, Zimbabwe, sometimes we can find things that we need in, in, in Rwanda, in, in Zambia, and we don't necessarily have to think about going to the U.S. and getting an iPhone. So the, the African Pre-Continental uh, uh, Trade uh, the a AFCTA will certainly change a lot of things, but if there is a limitation when it comes to cross-border payment, we mm. might not be. It will not allow us to maximize the benefit of this integration. So the the issue of the cross-border payment it is very important because we tend to buy from the US or the Europe, but uh, we can sometimes make a better, a better, a best use of our resources thinking about uh, African countries. So okay. the is still, uh, still expensive, but things are changing in Africa. And for, for, for the guy or the, the kid that uh, made this question, I will say, don't think, if you think about telephone or mobile phone, don't think about iPhone. iPhone is very expensive. Look about <laughs> other options. So this I, is one I wanted to add. I, I agree. I just want to throw one thing out there. Uh, and... Um, first, uh, everything that Zachary said, excellently said, I, I agree with. I do want to, and I, I, I definitely, I'm a huge proponent of more manufacturing taking place in um, in Africa. Uh, I think that it would be a, um, a tragedy if that doesn't occur. But I would say that uh, iPhones, probably no phone, is manufactured in the U.S. right now, and that's mm -hmm. not why. So it's not cheaper because we're manufacturing it here, it's cheaper because uh, what His Excellency pointed out, being able to transfer capital, um, the trade agreements, these are things that create a, a more expensive or a less expensive uh, product to the consumer. So, uh, so it's not necessarily about where it's manufactured. And that's why I also encourage, as much as I encourage manufacturing, I encourage more of the technology development because that's where the real value is. Uh, someone, someone just hung up on us. Uh, but that's where the real value is. So give me a very extremely basic example. The design, the marketing, the brand management be behind a Nike shoe is what costs what makes the price a hundred dollars or probably more than that. I'm old. I'm showing my age. It's probably two hundred dollars more. The actual manufacturing of the shoe costs fifteen dollars. But it's everything that goes into it. So for Africa, if they're chasing the manufacturing um, component of the value of the value added chain, it's necessary to have for national security purposes. But the real value, the the real fat in the value added chain is being able to do the development having the know-how, developing new technologies, new coding, new program, new software. And I think that that's where you're going to be able to leapfrog in this in this environment going forward. Okay. Okay. 
And and you, you talk, so uh, His Excellency talked about uh, the African Free Trade Agreement. I know that Omar told, uh, talked about that as well. So I have two um, additional questions now. Is so uh, where are we with the African Free Trade Agreement? And um, that's a probably a question for for Omar because you 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 work with a lot of um, um, leaders at IC Publications, and uh, I would love to hear from you. Okay, so. With all the COVID-19 that is happening and the situation, where are we with the African Free Trade Agreement right now? Okay, so because of COVID, and uh, and it's not an excuse actually. I was speaking to the Secretary General, the new Secretary General from uh, the AFCFTA, and uh, and some people before um, there was a deadline of the first of July, so it was supposed to kick off today. It was supposed mm. to go live today, and uh, some people were critical of the African Union for pushing this back. And saying, okay, this is another African project that's again being pushed back because of lack of commitment or uh, lack of uh, uh, lack of willingness. But uh, but I spoke to him and he said, actually, you know, in terms of the AFCFTA, everyone is as committed as ever. If anything, people know that the importance of the AFCFTA coming on board is more important today than it's ever been. Just because the world is closing up to some extent, and because we need to start. For example, let me just use one practical example. You've got countries like Morocco and Egypt, they actually produce PPE equipment. So what they want to do is they want to make sure that African countries can receive this PPE equipment tariff-free. And, uh, and they want to make, to make sure that because they've got some export rules that it can't be exported outside of its country, then if Africa is considered as one country, as one zone, then these goods can travel from, uh, from Egypt, from Morocco to, uh, to Africa, A, at zero tariff. And, uh, and B, they're considered as if they're in the same zone. So that makes mm. the exchange of goods a lot, uh, a lot more practical, a lot more easy. But anyway, to come back to your point, it was supposed to kick off today on the 1st of July. They, they've uh, suggested that it should be pushed back to the 1st of January. That was a suggestion to the heads of state. And the heads of state okay. will most probably say that, yes, it'll, the 1st of January will be the new date. There are, there, and the reason it's been pushed back isn't because of a lack of commitment or, uh, or willingness from, uh, from the heads of state and the different countries, but it's from a practical perspective. You can't just, so you have to, there's in the, in the statutes of the AU, negotiations uh, such as these need to take place in different languages. The documents need to be passed in different languages. There's, uh, so there's more of a technical, technical issues that delayed the whole process. And, uh, and let's say from a statute perspective and from a uh, leg legal perspective, as opposed to uh, a lack of commitment and, and, and willingness from the different parties. But negotiations are taking place. I spoke to the, uh, to the Secretary General. He's, uh, mm. he's very confident that the 1st of January will, uh, will be accepted by the heads of state, although he's got no say in it. But he's confident that it will be. And he's also confident that the AFCFTA will work a lot better than WTO. So he's got WTO experience, and hopefully, our uh, one of our good, uh, good, uh, good uh, ambassadors, uh, such as uh, Ngozi, will be the next head of the WTO. But anyway, well, what he tells me is they look at the WTO and they've taken all the good bits from it, and they've learned from all the mistakes of the WTO to make sure that the AFCFTA works. They've looked at the good bits in terms of trade disputes as well. So there's obviously going to be a, uh, a body, an independent body. To resolve these uh, continental trade disputes or trade disputes between uh, if uh, if two companies are trading together and uh, and they want to resolve something or countries want to resolve something, so that uh, that body will be will be better than what the WTO have, and they've learned from everyone else. So uh, so I'm actually confident. He inspired me and he gave me a lot of confidence that uh, that things would be in order and that it's all going in the right direction. And I know that also we've got a lot of private sector commitment and support to make it happen. Ultimately, this is a private sector thing. So the private sector needs to trade, the private sector needs to grow, and they need to be able to, uh, to, uh, to grow their businesses regionally. So, uh, so I'm confident. And uh, despite what you hear in the headlines, things are actually taking place behind the scenes, and, uh, mm. and there's definitely a commitment to make it happen. Okay. Um, I feel better now. <laughs> And, uh, and the last question is for uh, His Excellency. Um, so, uh, when are we going to create, and that comes from, uh, from the audience, when are we going to create an innovation fund in Equatorial Guinea? That's a straightforward question. Okay. <laughs> um, 
We are going uh, together with Badea. We have this project I mentioned before to boost, uh, to support micro, uh, small, and medium enterprises. And within this uh, this project we are having with Badea, we are developing with Badea. We are going to create an innovation fund in Equatorial Guinea, and the name is also Innovation Fund. So mm. I hope uh, in the next few months it will be operative. So that is something we are working on. So it's a promise. Okay. And, uh, Dr. Sidi uh, is here. You can also confirm. Dr. Sidi, are you there? I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure that some people on the line are very happy to, to hear that. So thank you very much. Um, uh, very special um, guest. Thank you, uh, His Excellency, uh, again, Captain of Industries, for sharing all your, your, your vision on the, where Africa is going and how technology can impact the development of Africa. So now um, I would like to close and, um, and uh, give it back to uh, Teg. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.